<clears throat> thank you, Danny. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thank you all of you for uh, being here. It's, it's good to be back. Uh, it's good to be on the stage with Jack uh, for the second time in 12 hours. Maybe not all of you know this. Jack's a native of Alberta. Uh, he grew up in Edmonton. And uh, I've been joking that he's finally rediscovering his roots after all those years in Toronto. Uh, one other comment on Jack's, uh, on J Jack's presentation. I hadn't thought of it before, but Bill C-69 proposes to, it leaves the NEB in place, but the responsibility for C-69, which is, would be the new pipeline approval procedure, is now transferred to the Minister of Environment. Pipelines will now be under, and, and the office that's being created, I forget what the name of it is. Uh, environmental, assessment. environmental Assessment Agency? Yeah. Well, where would that be? Ottawa. <coughs> who, who, who gets jobs in Ottawa? Got to be bilingual, right? So immediately, nine out of 10 people uh, in downtown Calgary who know something about the business are disqualified from ever working there. Uh, so uh, pay attention to what happens with Bill C-69. Let's see. Uh, my message today is uh, pretty simple. I might, well, as I say, I might use a little more light up here, but uh, then you won't be able to see that. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I'm going to say, here's the problem, here are the issues, and, and here are some solutions. Uh, the problem, Jack, has already uh, given you a couple of the figures. Uh, since 1961, $611 billion billion have left this province. Uh, not by coincidence, uh, $476 billion of those ended up in Quebec. Uh, and then just in the last two months, indeed, in one weekend, well, Quebec says no to pipelines and... Uh, uh, the whole Energy East thing collapses earlier last year. And then in one weekend, uh, just before Christmas, almost ruined Christmas for me, on Friday, uh, on Friday we're told that uh, <coughs> Quebec, uh, the minister, get, pr premier gets up and says, well, we'll take that dirty oil in Quebec pipelines. And on Saturday, the prime minister announces a $1.2 billion increase in equalization for Quebec, right? Here's your reward. Now, let's be clear. Uh, Pipelines, nothing is more clearly a federal jurisdiction than interprovincial pipelines. It's like railroads, canals. This was, this was point number one for the, for the founders uh, of Confederation in the, in the 1867, was to open up a free trade zone north of the 49th parallel. And interprovincial trade, and in th those days it was more, you know, canals and then railroads, and then it became telecommunications and air, airplane. This is 100% federal jurisdiction. And Trudeau just walked away from what Quebec did because, as somebody I think alluded to, they want to win those seats in Quebec. So uh, this has no. I'll, uh, no, uh, we're okay. Uh, I think this has been a catalyst for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people in this room and myself have been focused on this issue for a while, but things are coming into sharper focus now. So let's look at the issue. I think the issue, uh, yeah, the issue can be stated pretty clearly. If Quebec were treated any way similar to how Alberta is treated, they would have left long ago. Uh, if we had the opportunity to renegotiate the terms of Confederation, only a lunatic would agree to what's happening right now. And so the bottom line, I think Jack is saying this too, and a lot of people are saying, though, I'm going to get to that, is that the status quo simply isn't acceptable anymore. I think that has to be a starting point, and it has to be something that, uh, you know, it, I think in this audience, that's probably a pretty easy sell. <laughs> but uh, we need that first, the problem, the numbers in that problem, that more Albertans need to know that. They don't know that. Because you know, most people are too busy to pay attention to a lot of this stuff. So we need to do some public education. In fact, there's a group going to be here today, a group from Edmonton that's trying to do more on public education in, in this field. And uh, we're going to have a little meeting at the dinner break tonight. And anybody who's interested in that can, can come. So that's the issue. Uh, how about a solution? Let's look at the next slide. Uh, this ain't going to happen by itself. Uh, Alberta has to push. And again, if, if you go back through Alberta history, uh, 
you know, Jack alluded to uh, Crown Lands. You know, Alberta and Saskatchewan, the only two provinces that didn't get Crown Lands when they became uh, provinces of Canada. Uh, that was a fighting point for your grandparents uh, for uh, 20, <coughs> 25 years until 1930. And uh, Premier Brownlee uh, and the UFA uh, fought an amazing fight. Uh, it's a wonderful story how they finally won that in 1930. Uh, fast forward to the 1950s, Premier Manning, the discovery of oil and gas in this province and getting it to you know, eastern Canada. But who's going to control the minute you put gas in pipelines going interprovincial? Who's going to control that? Ernest Manning had the foresight to create a the uh, Alberta uh, pipeline system, and that everything within Alberta was in Alberta uh, government-owned pipes, therefore subject to Alberta regulation. So Alberta never has gotten anything without fighting for it. Uh, Preston Manning showed us that in our own generation, and we're in, we're in we're, that's going to have to happen again. Um, we're going to need some allies, so we need to talk about reforms that we can get other provinces to get behind. And what I've suggested, and I'm happy to say, that uh, in the UCP leadership race, all of the contenders uh, agreed with this, that Alberta is going to have a, a referendum on equalization. Uh, and uh, both Brian Jean and Jason Kenney, at least, the, the two main contenders, both said if they won, they would have this. And Jason did win, of course, and he's still committed to this. What, is it, what, what, what does this mean, a referendum on equalization? Well, uh, at the risk of <coughs> reverting back to my prior uh, life as a constitutional law professor, uh, but in th 60 seconds or less, if you go back to the 1997 Quebec secession referendum, you know, Quebec was had, remember the trick question in 1995, and Chrétien and brought in legislation, and so the Supreme Court, of course, ended up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court kind of went down the middle. It said, if a province has a referendum on a constitutional issue, it didn't say if Quebec does, and they didn't say on separation, it said if a province has a, ref has a referendum on a constitutional question and there's a clear majority on a clear question, again, these I'm paraphrasing but using the exact words of the Supreme Court, a clear majority on a clear question, then the federal government and the other provinces have a duty, that's the Supreme Court used it, a duty to negotiate. Now, negotiation doesn't mean you win, but it gets the bloody issue on the table. And that's, we need, we need a catalyst to begin discussion. And maybe the discussion will go in the direction of some of the policy changes that uh, Jack just mentioned. That's probably one option. But I would tend to agree with the gentleman there that everything Jack talked about I think would be very possible or plausible if we, if, if Mr. Trudeau and the Liberals are defeated uh, in the fall election. If they're not defeated in the fall election, I don't see hardly any of that happening uh, given their priorities. So, you know, does a referendum on, on uh, equalization with a, and, and well, just <coughs> would there be a clear majority on a clear question in Alberta on this issue? 70 percent? 80 percent? 90? I mean, go back to the figures and the problem, right? I don't care what party you're in. In fact, we're going to look at a few people in a minute that don't exactly strike me as conservative, who are now have been radicalized by this issue, I think we'd easily get 80 percent. And so it opens the door and starts discussion. So that's the, that's the idea there. Okay, Paul. Uh, where are we? Okay, just a repeat here. But this is, again, uh, you might wonder, you know, where, where do these numbers come from? Because, you know, there's lots of fake news floating around. Did, did Ted invent this while he was having a slow day in the duck blind one day? No. Uh, Robert Mansell, uh, most of you would recognize Robert's name. And, and again, for better or for worse, a lot of you have known me for a long time. I was harping on this issue back in the 1990s, right, the Senate election and all of that. Where did I get my data? Dr. Robert Mansell, Department of Economics from the 80s and 90s, and then a key fixture, Jack's right-hand man, at the School of Public Policy for the first decade there. And uh, God bless Robert, he's been doing this, these calculations. Uh, uh, Robert grew up in Hannah, so he's, he's solid. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Robert is a, uh, he, he is a uh, member of the Royal Society, he's a 
recognized economists across Canada. And so these numbers uh, are not Ted's fantasies from the duck blind. These are hard numbers that he keeps updating. God bless him for that. And he up, he's updated them, again, in the context of what's happened recently, and he did a public presentation uh, just last week. Okay. Uh, now, where do these, how does this money get moved around? Well, we always talk about equalization. Equalization is actually the smallest of the three federal transfer programs. There are, there are the numbers of the others. This is from, uh, what does it say, 20, 2015, 16? Yeah. So there are the numbers, 17 billion on equalization, uh, 34 on Canada health transfer, and, and uh, 13 on Canada social transfer. Again, equalization, Jack's talked about, it's on so-called fiscal capacity. Uh, I could bore you to tears or make you so angry you'd, you'd be crying if uh, some of the, and, and Jack was merciful that he didn't do that to you. you know, why are energy revenues included in fiscal capacity? Are fisc is, is, is selling oil and gas a one-off sale of a, of a barrel of oil like tax collection every year? Of course not. There's Supreme Court decisions that clearly say that they're not. And yet, of course, and when did oil get added to the formula? Well, 1960. Oh, what was happening in 1960? Oh, suddenly those crazy Albertans had some money. Yeah. Let's, let's add, let's add uh, energy revenues to... Uh, so, but no, but not hydroelectricity. That would cause, that would cause upset in Quebec, and we can't do that. So I, I'm not going to go there, but I just did. Uh, Canada Health and Social Transfers. Now, these are a little different. These are uh, distributed on a per capita basis. There used to be a redistributive element to those as well, but another person who we all love, Stephen Harper, amended both of those while he was prime minister to, to a per capita. So uh, it's a set dollar number that every province gets per person, right? So there's no equalization, there's no transfers, right? Wrong. There is a transfer, because where the hell does that money come from? It comes from what Jack just said. It comes from progressive tax policies, which Albertans, because we have a younger, younger population, higher levels of employment, and higher, higher incomes, we pay much more taxes. So there, these have indirect transfer capacity uh, transfers as well. And, uh, and I'll end, just before I end, think about it for a minute. These three programs together, if you combine them, what does it come to? $64 billion? It's the single largest category of expenditure in the federal budget. What does that tell you about why do we have a federal government? Is, it, is its main purpose just to move money around to win elections? I, I, that's a question. I, I don't know. But I have a hunch. Okay. <laughs> Now, finally, one more. Then we have other, other types of indirect transfers out of Alberta, uh, OAS and, uh, and uh, EI. Again, these are in the payments to individuals, not payments to, not payments to uh, provincial governments. But again, there's a redistributive element to them precisely because as a younger, more highly, uh, higher workforce and higher salaries, we contribute much more into these programs uh, then we take out. And again, this, uh, one of the points that Jack brought up on equalization, but it would apply here too, I think, that if we could, if we could negotiate a tax point transfer back to Alberta, we could, if not eliminate, at least reduce some of this. If I under, uh, Jack's going to have to give me a little more schooling on tax points, I think. <clears throat> okay, so there's, uh, we can move on from that. So there's Jack rediscovering his roots. Uh, all his friends in Toronto, he might not get invited to nice cocktail parties anymore for the kind of comments he's making, uh, uh, particularly that last one, the Al Brexit, uh, the Al Brexit uh, comment. But uh, people, uh, can, uh, can people see that in the back or not? Young people can, old people can't. Yeah, I got that problem. <laughs> The last one says, whatever negatives Alberta would, f would face are easily swamped by the positives that would come out with separation. See, that cost Jack some invitations to some nice cocktail parties. Uh, no, but, but seriously, again, when Jack Mintz says something like, something like that, people on Bay Street, uh, people in Ottawa pay attention. Uh, next uh, slide, please. David McKinnon. None of you know who David McKinnon is. He was a senior civil servant in... Uh, in uh, the Ontario government. 
He also did some work uh, for Ames, uh, for a friend of ours, uh, Marco Navarro, that a bunch of you know. Um, and Frontier. Okay, and for, excuse me, Peter. Yes, he, and with, he was the Frontier representative here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so here's what David, you know, why is David McKinnon say, what, what's this study? This study really makes it clear that the entire uh, system of regional subsidies is nonsense. It shows that everything the federal government has been saying for public for 50 years is, is misleading. Equalization is doing fundamental, what's he talking about? Well, there was a, a policy study done, uh, in, let's see if I have the details here, in the Federal Finance Department in 2006. It was called expenditure need, equalization's other half. What it showed was equalization, is, as uh, Jack mentioned, is now calculated just on fiscal capacity. And even that formula is crazily, crazily slanted against us. But what's the other half of the equation? You know, when you, uh, you, know, you all have budgets for your homes and your businesses, there's, there's revenue flow, but then there's the cost on the other side. How much does it cost to take care of a person in... Uh, in downtown Vancouver or downtown Toronto compared to uh, uh, New Brunswick or Quebec. What's the cost of health care delivery? Whoa, it turns out it's a lot, lot less. That's the other half of the equation. It's not even taken. So this study was done, and it found that Quebec, if you, and again, this is when Ontario, let's not get into this, but this is when Ontario was so misgoverned for so long, it became a have-not province, right? So. So this was done. Ontario should be getting six billion dollars, no, four billion dollars more, and Quebec should be getting six billion dollars less because the cost of delivering health care there was that much less less expensive. This was done in 2006. You remember reading about it? No, you didn't read about this. This was buried deep, deep, deep for four or five years. In 2009, one morning, David McKinnon, working then in the Ontario uh, Finance Department, woke up and there was a brown envelope in his, uh, in his mailbox. And he opened it up, lo and behold, copy of the report. But I've been, obviously, I've been in contact with David. David said, I could not go public with it because if I did, it would put at risk the person who had, who had released the information. So he went to the School of Public Policy at uh, U of T. Uh, what's? School. Okay, school. Uh, and they, they submitted a, uh, a FOIP, a Freedom of Access, uh, we, that's FOIP here uh, in Alberta, Freedom of Information Request uh, to Ottawa for this report. They got it. It was heavily redacted. Redacted means it's kind of, you know, like when you're a kid and you didn't want your parents to see your report card. You blacked it out before you brought it home. That's what redaction is. And the report that they got on this FOIP request was so heavily redacted, you couldn't make any sense out of it whatsoever. And so uh, somebody mysteriously, I'm not going to say who, gave the, the real copy, both the redacted copy and the other copy to the Toronto Star. And the Toronto Star ran an article, um, Ontario shortchanged in wealth sharing system, censored federal reports suggest. Okay? So Ontario, again, I'm going to come back to Ontario. Ontario's not that crazy about equalization either for reasons like this. And, uh, uh, but it, what does it say about how things work in Ottawa that not only was this report completely suppressed for four years, when it was finally released, it was uh, censored so heavily you couldn't even make sense out of it. Uh, what do we have next? Oh, well, this is just <laughs> for a uh, reminder. Uh, you know, a lot of people, everybody remembers NEP1. Um, the campaign chairman for Mr. Trudeau, uh, Keith Davey, uh, is alleged to have said, now he never denied that he didn't say it, that their strategy with the NEP, you know, which is you know, cap on oil prices, taxes on exports of gas, if we screw the West, we can take the rest. And you know how that works. You got a bunch of voters, a bunch of areas back east that are voter rich and energy poor, and you got Alberta and Saskatchewan out here who are energy rich and voter poor, so screw them, move that cheap energy back east, and you win an election, right? So you don't have to be a genius to see that's a pretty reliable election for winning, elect a pretty reliable formula for winning elections, and I 
think we may, as others have suggested, the na national environmental program of his son is in NEP2 if it's not, if things like C69 are not dealt with and seri seriously revised. Uh, so that's bad news, I guess. Here's some good news. There are people now coming out who you never would have guessed would say these kind of things uh, five years ago. Most of you know Ron Gitter. Uh, he, was, he was in uh, the Klein cabinet, I believe, Getty cabinet, Getty cabinet. Uh, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, I'd be a little careful about labels, but we talk about blue Tories and red Tories. Uh, Ron's definitely a red Tory. Uh, did Ron sign up for the Alberta agenda and Ted Morton back in uh, 2005 and 2006? No way. Uh, Ron Gitter does not like me or the Alberta agenda. But if you read his piece in the Calgary Herald a couple weeks ago, you know, if, if I don't have false teeth altogether, but sometimes my, uh, some of these uh, caps fall off. Mine almost did, uh, reading that. Uh, and he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting separation, but I do suggest that we take steps to more or less control within our borders. And then his list of things, I should, I should write him and ask for a little fee. Basically, it was the Alberta agenda, right? Yeah. It was the Alberta agenda. So, so this is good news, though. If people like Ron Gitter have reached this point, and I didn't get a, uh, I wanted to get a quotation from uh, uh, who's our reliable liberal columnist in the Calgary Herald? Braid, Don Braid. Don Braid, in the last two months, sounds like Ted Morton in 2000 and 2001. And it, <laughs> yeah, good for Don, yeah. Yeah, good for Don. So what's happened is moving public opinion. Okay, where does that take us? Uh, this is the piece I wrote uh, uh, last year. It's uh, on C2C. Some of you, you've read it. I reviewed, there was a new book out on equalization, about 140 pages. Uh, uh, my wife, Bambi, God bless her. Uh, I took this book with me on uh, over Christmas holiday down to Florida, and I started reading it, and uh, she was ready to shoot me by the, because I ended up writing a 14-page review of this book. And I loved writing it because I thought I'd read this book. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not an economist like Jack, I, although my degree is political economy before they separated. So I did do one year of graduate economics. But I thought maybe there's something to equalization I'm missing, right? Here's a book written by uh, uh, three economists. And so I'll, all of my worst suspicions about equalization are confirmed by this book. So if you want to uh, uh, put yourself to sleep some night, go to C to C and you can read this. These are some quotations uh, from my review of that book. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Where are we next? Okay. Now, a lot of people are saying, is it time to, uh, to go back to, and I, you know, I've been getting emails, phone calls, uh, conversations at the bar. Uh, it's time to bring out the firewall again, right? Uh, I think the answer is no. Uh, I think the answer is no, at least not yet. Uh, what is the single most pressing existential threat? I, and, and I agree, I think it is an existential threat to Alberta right now. It's, a, it's the bloody pipeline issue. We need, Trans Mountain Pipeline has to be built. Has to be. Uh, anybody who works or has friends that work downtown the oil and gas sector know how, how desperate things are. Uh, I'm on the board of a little company We've doubled our production last year. We doubled our production again this year, and our, our stock price is half of what it was a year ago. There's no, nobody wants to be anywhere near Western Canada right now because you, you can't get your oil out, you can't get the world price, and now Bill C-69 might make it worse. So this is an existential threat. Does, and, and the, uh, let, let's just go back one if you can, Paul. So, you know, the idea of the Alberta agenda was kind of a fortress Alberta. We'll, we'll be like Quebec, we'll collect our own taxes, uh, we'll have our own police force, kind of a fortress Quebec, a, a, a fortress Alberta. Fortress Alberta doesn't get the pipeline built. There's some parts of the Alberta agenda that may still make sense, and they fit in a little bit with what Jack was talking about on income tax collection or tax points maybe that rather than, it, uh, I still, uh, well, I, 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 I I still think uh, we, rural Alberta would be a hell of a lot safer if we had an Alberta police force than the RCMP. I'm sorry, it would be. Uh, and so there are parts of the Alberta agenda that still make sense, but the focus on Fortress Alberta doesn't get a pipeline built. 
So we can cherry pick out of this, but that's not the way forward. Uh, we need something bigger. Now, one possibility are the policy reforms that Jack talked about, and uh, those might be doable if we get a change of government in, uh, in Ottawa, and I'm all for trying to do that. But here's another way. Here's another way, and it begins with having the referendum and forcing Ottawa and the other provinces to, to uh, negotiate uh, in good faith uh, on, a, on a constitutional issue where there's a clear majority on a clear question. You know, it's time to say, look, Quebec, this, all this equalization and transfer began when Quebec said it wanted more political autonomy. Well, they're still asking for more political autonomy, and they're getting, they've gotten $487 billion in the meanwhile. And it's, I think it's time to say enough is enough. You, know, you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. And, if, and we'd be happy to give you your political autonomy, uh, but leave our money with us. That would be the grand bargain, okay? Um, you want to be metro chez nous, you want sovereignty association, fine. Maybe some other provinces might like to have that too. I can think of one or two, uh, yeah, so can you. Uh, actually, I can think of three or four. Uh, so make us more like the EU, Let, you know, a big, the, a grand bargain. How would that work? Where would that take us? Uh, <coughs> something like this. Uh, well, first of all, you get rid of the powers of reservation and disallowance. They never should have been there to begin with. That's a, that's a hangover from uh, imperial uh, British policy. Charter of Rights decisions. That, you know, Quebec, it's a, why, Quebec has never signed the 1982 constitutional amendment. You know that? They've, they've never signed it, right? Why? Because they don't want the Supreme Court sitting as a, uh, as a you know, kind of a substitute uh, rule maker for their elected governments. And, uh, how the, and the rest of us, you know, and Peter Lougheed saw this danger. He insisted on the notwithstanding clause, right? That was going to be what would protect us from judicial misinterpretation in Ottawa. But you all know what's happened to the notwithstanding clause. It's fallen into disrepute and can't be used. So uh, let's do it. You know, the United Kingdom looked at what Canada did. They adopted a charter of rights. They said, you can take a, if you don't like a, if you think a statute violates one of the charter, one of these human rights, take it to the courts. You can adjudicate it right to the final court of appeal. But the final court of appeal can say this law is unconstitutional, but it doesn't invalidate the law. It's advisory. And then that kicks it back into the political process, and that issue is decided there. Is, is the UK a tyranny? Are, you know, are, are, are the jackboots running around the UK? No. This is a democratic approach to protecting human rights. Uh, transfer of appointment of provincial rights to uh, provincial judges to provincial courts. Again, only, in, only two federal countries in the world do this, have, where the federal government appoints provincial judges, uh, India and Canada. Why? Legacy of British imperial policy. And then Jack brought these up already, control over immigration, which Quebec already has. Why shouldn't the rest of us? And uh, collection of personal and corporate taxes. These would be what's on the bargaining table that Quebec would get explicitly and other provinces that wanted it. What do, what do provinces lose? Well, obviously, equalization goes out the window completely uh, for all the reasons we've just talked about. The Canada health and social transfers probably should not or could not be phased out immediately, but you could phase them out over a 10-year period. Uh, but uh, legal powers are re a very explicit bright, bold, clear message that interprovincial infrastructure, whether it's pipelines or railroads or transmission lines or pipelines, are a federal jurisdiction and no province, you know, provinces, can, provinces can be consulted. They have a right to be consulted on this, on environmental issues, but there is no provincial veto, veto right? The pipelines get built. Now, so there's, there's a constant, there's a, Jack laid out kind of a statutory path of reform. These would, this would require constitutional reform. And, you know, look how hard it is to, you know, is this just, you know, Ted, you know, Ted's retired, probably spending too much time in the duck blind. You know, is he just fantasizing this is possible? Maybe, but it's worth trying because we do have, you know, I'm, and let's get back to some good news. We have some allies out there right now. Uh, uh, Scott Moe, uh, strong ally of Alberta. Uh, he, and then, uh, Premier, Premier Ford in Ontario, Saskatchewan and Ontario are challenging the carbon tax. And uh, if, uh, let's say, when Jason Kenney wins, he'll, Alberta will be challenging that carbon tax too, right? 
So these are, these are allies on this issue. They're allies on you know, stronger rules against foreign interference in Alberta elections. You know, the Americans are worried about Russians fooling around in their elections. What, what, what American INGO groups have done in our elections uh, on, on, on energy and pipeline and environment issues is 10 times that. And I, and I don't, and, and again, you can't, you can't follow the money, but I doubt very much it's just environmental end goes. I think there are competitors out there, mainly OPEC, that are getting upset that they're losing market share in the U.S. to Canadian, to Canadian imports, which they have. Their, our exports are up by almost double. Their imports to the U.S. are down by almost half. Um, so we have some allies out there. Now I know uh, British Columbia now, we all badmouth British Columbia. I have friends that won't even go there anymore. They, they won't, you know, we won't drink BC wine. Let's remember, it's a minority government. It's not all of BC. How long do minority governments usually last in, in Canada? Less than two years. And they, they're coming up two years now. I mean, that by-election the other day could have, could, have, could have swung. So, and historically, BC has been an ally of Alberta. And, and BC and Alberta together are a powerful. They, both population-wise by a little bit, GDP by a ton are much more important than Quebec now. Uh, we surpassed Quebec in GDP and population about two decades ago, and, we, and we're still leaving Quebec behind. Separated, we're actually pretty weak. Together, we're very strong. And I think with the right leaders out there, uh, BC is potential. And, and BC, again, is one of the have provinces that gets screwed by equalization. So uh, you know, I'm not happy with what they're doing right now. But down the road, I think BC is an ally as well. Um, so it comes back. Well, what is, is Quebec interested in any of this? We'll never know unless we ask, right? You never know unless you ask. And what's being offered here, you know, Metro New Sovereignty Association, that's what they've been talking about and blackmailing us with for 50 years. So why not tell them? You can have it. But here's, here are the terms. Uh, so we come back to the issue. And, the, and this, we always have to come back to the issue. If Quebec were treated like this, they would have left. If we had a chance to renegotiate it, uh, we never would have signed. And the status quo is completely unacceptable. We, it does need to be renegotiated. And finally, um, so what we have to do, we, we have to challenge the status quo. Uh, the re, you know, is a referendum a, a guarantee that things will change? No. But it, it, it forces the issue onto the agenda. And it, and it forces the federal government and the other provinces to talk about it. It opens the door. And then maybe that broader, uh, that broader set of issues, the grand bargain could be brought in, or maybe it's something more modest. Maybe it's the policy reforms that Jack talked about. But we, gotta, we can't knock on the door. We've got to kick the bloody door in. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions, but my, my first, I get to get to ask the first question this time, Gordon, then we'll get to you. Like, uh, Ted, you weren't here this morning, but I said, uh, and Michelle, you'll be after Gordon, but like in 2005 and 2010, Paul was an elected ML and he practically begged the government not to re-sign the equalization, uh, equalization agreement. Like what? And Quebec hadn't signed the constitution and people were blown away with that. He said, what? Exactly. So what, what's wrong with just not re-signing? I realize this time they, they, re they sent it in, in, on the fi in, the, in 2015 without renegotiating, but what, what, what would happen if Alberta just said, we're not signing, like we're done with this? Like I assume it would force the discussion anyway, wouldn't it, Ted, or how does that work? I think a true answer is that no one knows because nobody's done that before, so it's hard to say. The practice has been, as Jack said, the principle of equalization is in Section... 36, 35 or 36 of the Constitution Act, uh, 1982. But the, the formula for what it is or the amount of money involved is not in the Constitution. So that's all up, up to uh, uh, discussion. And the convention has been, the equalization was taking place before 1982. Uh, the federal government has always consulted with provinces on that. But uh, I think it's 90% certain that uh, if one province doesn't show up or doesn't doesn't want to doesn't like what the feds are doing, it's too bad. Uh, so so sad. So yeah. So, so so basically, having the referendum is sort of forcing the issue onto the agenda. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, Gordon, go ahead. Well, I was very pleased to hear you uh, have that immigration on, on the list there because there's a group of us in Ontario 
we feel that that's extremely important. And, and one of the concerns we have, and we're wondering how does this get resolved, uh, if each province controls its own immigration, the problem we have is next door there's Quebec. I mean, Quebec brings in all of these uh, francophones from other countries, and the first thing they do is come over to Ontario and then start making unrealistic demands in terms of French language service to them, and, and, and creating, essentially, a political disruption. It's, ac it's actually much worse than that. This has been a scam that, that Quebec's been running for 20 years since they got control of their immigration. Because they get control of immigration, oh, surprise, Ottawa gives them money that otherwise Ottawa would have spent. On, and the money is not just, you know, to kind of help them through the, uh, the through visas and, and at the border. It's for ed language education, uh, housing, settlement, uh, job training. But... 90% of them leave within, and, and this is for like a two-year period, so they get the money you know, per, per immigrant for a couple years of, of this resettlement training and so forth, and then within six weeks or six months, they, they pop off to Ontario. Because why? Because they get treated like, they get treated real badly in Quebec. And, uh, how, does the, how, does, how does the government, de how does the government deal with that in the future? I think you're shit out of luck. Be, they should have to stay in the province <laughs> no, they came to. No, I mean, this... This is just one more example of how things are, example after example of how you, you look at program after program, that if you actually get into the actual execution of it, Quebec makes off like bandits. Michelle, Michelle Sterling, yes, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, I, I know a lot of people know about the tar sands campaign, but do people know that a lot of the tar sands campaign also was funded into Quebec? like 11 million dollars at least and there's a group down there called the global climate change action committee which um, has uh, 470 ngos worldwide in 70 countries who are completely opposed to fossil fuels and i would say that that's probably more the reason why energy east got blocked because of the radicalization of the population there more so than quebecers per se as individuals but are, are you aware of of that influence well, there? Sure. Uh, I, I'm very aware of it. Everybody here is aware of it. But is the general public aware of it? No. The, the media ignored it completely until about the last year. The last year it's finally soaking in, thanks in part to our former MP sitting right here, yeah, uh, who, uh, uh, Joan, uh, who headed a committee to try and draw the attention to uh, what was the group called? Uh, get Re Lead Now. Lead, lead now uh, heavily involved in the uh, last election, targeted 29 writings where the environmental vote could defeat a PC and elect uh, either a liberal or an ND. One of them was they knocked, they, 25 of the 29 they won, poured tons of, of outside money into, that, into, into organizing those. If, 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 a, if, a conservative, if there was conservative money coming in from the U.S. to do that on the conservative side, the Globe and Mail would be uh, calling for riots, right? Uh, but, you know, complete silence uh, from the liberals and, and the Globe and Mail until recently, thanks to the work of Joan and others. But I think Andrew Scheer and the, and the, and the conservative party, the federal conservatives, uh, are going to and will make this. And Jason Kenney is make, and Jason Kenney will make it an issue. And it's another one of those issues that will uh, unite that coalition of, of uh, conservative premiers to, uh, you know, get change underway. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to Joan Crockett for, she did lead that, Joan and uh, Vivian Krauss have been instrumental in that, and yeah, so I thank you very much. Give, give, jo yeah, give, give, give Joan a hand, I introduced our, yeah, thank you, Joan. Bill, Bill Buick, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks, Ted. One thing missing from your uh, one slide where you listed the different transfers was CPP, and I do agree that uh, we need to be very strategic, too close? Not close, all right, there we go. Uh, what, we do need to be strategic given how important the pipeline is on, on what we sort of saber rattle over. But it seems to me that, that the only thing that would make Trudeau's liberals nervous is if we looked like we were serious about doing our own pension plan and pulling out of CPP like Quebec's done. Because we do pay a lot more into it than we get out of it. And, uh, and, and I wonder if that's something that might be worth putting into a, a little mini firewall to get their attention along with the referendum. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, <coughs> and the other things I've written, CPP is in there. Uh, again, I uh, urge you to go look at the article on C to C. 
it has a much more entertaining uh, title, uh, Screwing the West to Pay the Rest. And CPP is one of those programs. I didn't put it in today because I, when I was just putting this together in the last couple of days, I, I, I didn't have the mechanics of the transfer and CPP uh, in my head, so I left it out just to be cautious. Okay, yeah, go ahead. And I also have just gotten my first CPP check, so I'm going to be a little careful. <laughs> Speaking of, you know, self-interest, yes, go ahead, Norm. Uh, I'm actually an awful lot older than I look. I've gotten about four years of those. Um, uh, one of the big things on transfer payments uh, that doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere or is uh, Maxime Bernier. Um, if you listen to what he says, he could have given your talk for you. He's exactly on side with, um, with transfer payments, uh, with pipelines, and he has a much higher rating in Quebec than he's given in the, uh, in the media. Um, so I guess the question is, do you think he's going to be able to get some of this stuff on our behalf? I'd love to go out drinking or partying with Max, uh, but I wouldn't want to uh, bet my political future on him. Uh, he had a reputation for bad judgment before, and I think what he's done now, walking out of the uh, Federal Conservative Caucus, is uh, just flat-ass flat stupid. Uh, and uh, you know, the last thing we need is, is dividing conservative votes. So, like I said, I, I know Max is a good guy. I know on policy he's real strong. I'm not assuming that. But, again, the, there are a couple of... When you actually sit in a caucus or sit in a cabinet, uh, there's the policy issue, and Max is good on policy, but there's a character and judgment issue, too, and I don't think Max uh, measures up too well there. Catherine, go ahead. I have a question, uh, Ted. You mentioned Section 33 and how it couldn't be used. Uh, would you explain that a little more? No. <laughs> It, legally, it can be used, of course, but uh, nobody has the cojones to, to use it anymore, right? Because you immediately are accused of being uh, uh, misogynist or racist or homophobic or, what, or whatever else. Uh, although, uh, the exception, of course, is, uh, no, well, well Ford. Uh, well, it was, used ex it was used by Quebec on everything for a decade, right? And that also stigmatized the use. Uh, we, again... <sighs> Well, I won't go down. I'd love to go down that road, but I'm not. It was it, it was it, it was stigmatized by its overuse in Quebec. But again, Ford used it in the first two months he was in power. Ford used it, and some of you might have noticed that I wrote a piece in the uh, either the Globe and Mail or the or the National Post uh, saying, "Good for you, Mr. Ford. Go ahead and use it." Thank you, Ted. No, last question. Sorry, uh, uh, Todd, it's got to be really short. We're really tight for time. I appreciate that very much, Ted. I really enjoyed your presentation, and I know you'll give a good, frank, honest answer to this. Some of the things <laughs> you're proposing are going to take time, and significant time, for us to have a referendum that's somehow going to allow us to engage the rest of the country. That, to me, when I look back at the years of Peter Lawley, that could take years for that to work its way through. Alberta doesn't have years. Drayton Valley, Brooks, all of these communities that are relying on the oil and gas industry are on their last legs. 20 seconds, Don. Many, many companies that we've taken for granted that are foundational to this province are not going to be here. We've got a fight now. Is there anything that you would suggest that we should be doing? You saw yesterday in the news a party that doesn't exist would rule Western Canada right now with respect to 60% supporting separatism. We've got to get this front and center, and we've got to fix this now. Yeah, T Timing is everything in uh, business, uh, uh, love, and politics. And uh, nothing would be more stupid than to start another reform party or Western party now before this fall's election. Our best chance of getting ch change in, in the next nine months is to elect Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives. And the, the quickest way not to do that is to hang around with Mad Max in Quebec or any other uh, quasi-separatist party here. Let's have a fall election here, a spring election here, and get a, a, a strong spokesman, an articulate spokesman, somebody who can go across the country and articulate everything we're talking about here. Jason Kenney. Let's elect him in May, and let's, let's work 
and let's work, because we everyone here has contacts and friends across the rest of Canada, and help Sheer and the Conservatives win federally. If that doesn't work, then we start, then, then timing, but timing is everything, and right now, that kind of talk, uh, all the focus, all the energy, all the money should be on winning these next two elections. Thank you very much. It's, uh